So, uh, Stephen, thanks a lot for joining us on this first uh, podcast on Visa in Hong Kong. So, uh, it's it's a pleasure to receive you. Thanks to be the the really first one and taking the experience the, the experience with me. Uh, well, we know each other for a long time now, so um, that's I think that would be a, a good uh, a, a good uh, interview. Uh, so, just for you to know, Stevens is uh, Mr. Visa in Hong Kong. Has been doing uh, visas for thirty something years. Uh, if you need anything about visa, is the guy to to listen to, you know, or to talk to if you if you have actually uh, some some specific questions. So today we will do a bit of an overview of what's going on in Hong Kong in 2022, almost 2023, because we are at the end of the year. So things won't really. Uh, three. Gosh. Time flies. The COVID just. Just yeah. Okay. Down. So 2023 and even starting uh, to have an idea of what's going on for 2024. So we will have an idea of what is the landscape of. Uh, visa and then after we'll go a bit more specific into the the business visa which is the one that uh, most of the people in my audience are interested in um, I think I can just start can you just maybe let us know a little bit like what is the situation in Hong Kong how easy it is to get a visa what are the different options and uh, yeah I think it's a good start okay so I've been doing this stuff for 30 years now and I've been in Hong Kong for 35 years so I've seen basically everything in Hong Kong since 1984 the Sino-British Joint Declaration. I was doing visas for the press pack in the run-in to the handover in 1997 so we were coming out of the back of what was a difficult period during the protests and then of course like the rest of the world we went into Covid which had its own particular challenges in Hong Kong with very strict quarantine lack of flights, a lot of um, foreign nationals who didn't have residence visa here is getting stuck and it's been a tumultuous sort of four years really on the immigration front. We came out of Covid uh, six, seven months ago and uh, there's been uh, quite a significant adjustment in the way that immigration policy is experienced by foreign nationals that uh, want to come and live and work and start businesses in Hong Kong. First, I think it's important to say that the doors are open in Hong Kong. We're wide open to all um, foreign nationals that want to come and participate in our economy and establish businesses. We've always been like that. We've always been a very dynamic economy that's welcomed foreigners. Certainly, you need to have the right immigration status to be able to pursue those business activities in Hong Kong. But I would say for the first time in probably 15 years, it's been more favorable now to secure immigration status to be able to come and establish businesses compared to the time in the past. Why? Well, obviously, we lost a lot of foreign national experts and professionals as a result of COVID. A lot of young people also migrated out of Hong Kong, taking advantage of new immigration programs and liberalized immigration opportunities for countries such as, oh, such as Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK. These have always been yeah, sort a lot of, of local left to the UK. Yeah. I saw like 150,000, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, these have always kind of been dream locations for mm. the young people here mm. in Hong Kong. So when the, those programs opened up, they tended to take advantage of them en masse, consequently leaving behind a uh, gap in talent and uh, young people who are really sort of equipped to be able to deal with the modern economy and the economic opportunities that the modern economy represents. Mm -hmm. So this has filtered its way through to the way that immigration programs have been designed and have been uh, kind of uh, anticipated and administered the old ones which we'll talk about have had a little bit of liberalization to them because the immigration department want to encourage uh, foreigners to come to Hong Kong as I say and sort of participate in our economy so broad message it's probably easier to get immigration status in Hong Kong now than it's ever been they don't give the visas away you've mm -hmm. still got to qualify but the government recognizes that we're in a race for talent, we're in a competition for the brightest and the best. Hong Kong has always had at its sort of engine um, a very important foreign national community that come to uh, take advantage of our entrepreneurial environment and we're a unique entrepreneurial economy. Mm -hmm. where Every jurisdiction have got their own 
you know, advantages and whatever, but Hong Kong has got a particularly unique entrepreneurial dimension to it. And um, foreigners that have spent any time, any amount of time here realize what that's all about. It's easy to make money in relative terms. Uh, and they want to be here for the long haul to be able to take advantage of that. That's why we're in business as well. And all. Well, 30 <laughs> years I've been doing this and I've, I, you, I mean, I've, how long have you been at it now? I've been working with you for 10 years at least, I think. Yeah, tw tw at tw least. Almost, yeah. about your age, tw 11 and a yeah, half years. Yeah. Or about that, yeah. I th I've got videos of you and me on my website that go yeah, back we're to... We're young, we, we look way younger. Yeah. For me, I look like a baby. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so, you know, without sort of waxing too long and too lyrical for too much time, mm -hmm. let me tell you how you get here. So, you can come to Hong Kong if you have a job offer from a well-established company and you are a university degree holder with a minimum of two years post-graduation working experience in a managerial or supervisory capacity. Obviously, that doesn't apply specifically to entrepreneurs, but if you've got uh, a desire to eventually establish a business in Hong Kong and you've got a particular skill set that will be attractive to an employer in Hong Kong that's in a position to sponsor you for an employment visa then without a doubt this could be a very easy pathway in arrive in Hong Kong work for another employer for 12 months get your feet on the ground know what it's all about and one of the core advantages about taking that pathway in is that the moment that you become a resident of Hong Kong, if you subsequently decide you want to become an entrepreneur visa as a resident in it's Hong easy. Kong, changing your visa category from mm -hmm. sponsored employment through to business investment as an entrepreneur, then the uh, application consideration process is, is considerably liberalized. The default posture of the immigration department in relation to business investment visas as an entrepreneur from existing residents is to approve them rather than refuse them. The idea being that if you're in Hong Kong, you've settled in, you know how the town works, you've got a sense for kind of like, you know, how you might go about best contributing to Hong Kong's economy as an entrepreneur. As long as you can tick all the boxes and do and tell the right story in the right way in terms of the application, it's a it's an argument you need to win in your application, but the default posture of the immigration department is to approve those applications from existing residents seeking that status rather than refuse them, mm -hmm. which is not exactly the case if you're coming in from outside as a visitor or as a non-resident. It's a little bit, well, it's, it's somewhat harder to win the day. Um, and the liberalization that the immigration department afford to existing residents is not available. So it's always advantageous to try and get your foot in the door get yourself resident status and then apply for the status. Well, it also means if somebody is already a, a resident of Hong Kong, basically it will be easier to, to move to a, to, to, um, business a business investment, investment visa. As an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So yeah. if, because yeah, we, we may have people, I mean, that doesn't mean if you are from abroad and you want to start a business here, you have to first find a job in Hong Kong. No, it's of like course it, not. It, but if you are here, it's easier to move towards yeah. uh, a business investment visa than if you were abroad. Yeah. My philosophy is always to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. You might be sitting in France today and you might be thinking, mm, I'm really interested in going to Hong Kong and I've got this idea for a business. But it's all a bit new, it's all a bit risky, you don't quite know too many people yet. You know, you've visited in the past, you like Yum Chai, you know, Hong Kong's a great geography. Mm -hmm. You really fancy it. But instead of sort of throwing yourself at the entrepreneur status right out of the starting gate, Get yourself a job, work for a year or so, contribute that way, and then apply for the visa. There is a this this raises a question here because I have people asking it from time to time. Is that if you already work here and you are you are being employed by a company, can you actually run a company on the side? You can. No. However, you do have to get two specific permissions. You need mm -hmm. to get the permission of your existing employer in writing to the extent that they have no objection to you joining in that side business. That's a condition precedent to the next approval that you need to get, which is a formal application to the immigration department for their express permission to join in that side business, obviously with your present employer's consent in writing. Mm -hmm. That's an application you need to make separate to your existing employment visa permissions that you've got. It takes six to eight weeks. 
once again, as long as your employer confirms in writing that they have no objection to it, mm -hmm. you go through the process of demonstrating that the enterprise that you're seeking to start on the side is kind of nascent, mm -hmm. something that could really grow into something more profound going forward as a sort of a hybrid halfway stage of in terms of the permissions to getting that to be able to do it full-time in due course by yourself you seek side business permissions so let me differentiate those side business permissions from say someone who's just got a job let's say they're a graphic designer and they want mm -hmm. to have a bit of pocket money on the side the immigration department don't encourage these small side gig small gigs type. Gigs, yeah. No, it's mm -hmm. a waste of their resources. So, when you're going for the side business permissions, you have to go through a process of kind of setting out a, a kind of hypothetical future of growth mm -hmm. and win that argument. Nine times out of ten, the immigration department say yes. So, okay. they will support those kind of applications. So, you can be an existing resident working for somebody else and get the permission of the immigration department to join in a side business. Okay. Okay, so that's um, that sort of deals with getting on with business, you know, whilst you're um, establishing yourself as a resident through an employment visa permission pathway. Mm -hmm. You can, of course, at any time, if you've got the potential to, and I quote, make a substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong, unquote, mm -hmm. which is a test for approval for a business investment visa as an entrepreneur. So when you think that through, what does substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong entail? Mm -hmm. Well, there's kind of four dimensions in play broadly to take on board when you're seeking to win the argument for the visa, for that particular visa type. The first is you need a good story. So kind of Hong Kong has got a kind of a, a, a sort of a library of businesses and business activities that are deemed to be kind of super beneficial to Hong Kong. Anything mm -hmm. to do with tech, anything to do with blockchain, anything to do with AI, mm -hmm. anything to do with our pillar industries which are banking, finance, anything to do with logistics. Or Greater Bay Area I guess. Well, well Greater Bay Area is a, it's part and parcel of the story, it's part and parcel mm -hmm. of the growth story. But in terms of what's deemed to be a welcome investment in Hong Kong, the closer you are to sort of modern stuff the better, especially if you're going to be introducing technologies and new ways of doing things, enhanced um, processes and the like. It all depends. At the end of the day, you can make the show pony look like a thoroughbred in any event because the immigration department take on board the representations that you make in writing mm -hmm. as part of the visa application and they will wish to buy into what you're saying without demanding a whole amount of information from you to prove let's say the veracity of what you're saying mm -hmm. you just have to tell a good story and carry yeah, an and argument what are the, the conditions now right. for these because before yeah. they i remember they had three business well, premises well, call, et yeah the three legs yeah. of the approvability stool uh -huh. so so Is the fourth the same? yeah the four things are a good story mm -hmm. then you need to have in the plan for your business a clear pathway to the creation of local employment opportunities mm -hmm. you can can't go to the immigration department and say, hey, I'm going to contribute substantially to the economy of Hong Kong, but I'm only going to be doing it myself as a one-man business. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in that. It's not about substantial contribution to the economy of the applicant. It's about contri substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong and indeed, by extension, the Greater Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So clear pathway to the creation of local employment opportunities. Secondly, you need to have in Hong Kong a properly set up office, not being your kitchen table or your spare bedroom. Mm -hmm. This has to be somewhere where you and your future employees, conceptually speaking, can report to work to each day. So co-working still no work? No okay. definitely works. Mm -hmm. yeah. The immigration department in recent years have acknowledged that it's a very modern way to go about putting a business roof over your head doing it in a, a cost-effective co workspace arrangement. Mm -hmm. When I first started this 20 year, 30 years ago, for this particular visa type, the single most expensive component of getting this visa was, was an office, just yeah. like you've got mm -hmm. here, you know, yeah. bricks and mortar, two-year tenancy, fitted out, you know, it costs money, right, to get these, yeah. um, these sort of things yeah, yeah. fitted out and equipped and whatever. We haven't got those expenses anymore, so that's a big, uh, big saving now, thankfully. Um, thirdly, you need to have resources, two types of resources. You need to have um, resources which speak to sustainability of the business on the one hand, and then you need to have resources which speak to your ability to finance the business plan, and at the same time, 
use those resources, those financial resources, to make an active investment in Hong Kong. The mm -hmm. visa type calls for an active investment. So is there a number for that nowadays? A million Hong Kong dollars, about 130,000 US dollars. Okay. But here's what's interesting. Whilst that quantum is acceptable to the immigration department, the immigration department will accept a loan from a shareholder so if they come to you and ask you to incorporate their limited liability company and to open their bank account for mm -hmm. them, their company bank account for them, they can transfer the one million Hong Kong dollars of 130,000 give or take US mm -hmm. dollars from their personal account to their Hong Kong company bank account and you can record that investment as a loan from a shareholder mm -hmm. because you're not having to capitalize yeah, that it's investment. It's not the capital, it's just bringing the money. But it's, you have to bring the you money. You have to have now. the money, you have to have okay. the money. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Compared to other jurisdictions like Australia, they've changed law recently, you can't even get that visa type anymore. But it used to be that you had to show that you capitalized okay. the investment. So it was like 250,000 Australian dollars that you couldn't get the visa and then take the money out because it was mm -hmm. a loan or move the money in around in a more efficient way. It was capitalized in the company. Mm -hmm. So fortunately in Hong Kong, the immigration department want to know that you've got the money. They're not so interested in how that money ends up reflected in your business, but it has to be in your Hong Kong company it has bank to be, account. Okay. Because I remember in the past it wasn't like that, right? Well, <sighs> you needed to just show you had the money, right? Well, they would they would ask for copy. They still do. They ask mm -hmm. for a cop three months personal bank statement to show that you've got the money. Mm -hmm. Now they want you. They want to see that you've moved the money out of your personal bank account so into the, the company corporate. bank mm -hmm. account. Yeah. So those are the funding resources that are required to um, get this visa type positively considered. And then you need resources which speak to sustainability of the business. What does that mean? Well, the Immigration Department are not going to approve you for this particular visa if they think that there's no realistic chance of you being able to materialize the, the numbers contained in your financial projections which form an integral part of the business plan which gives rise to you know the availability of this visa. You can't get a visa just because you say you're going to do this, you're going to show that you've got something kind of concrete in your opportunity and show it to them that it actually does exist. That's the bad news. The good news is that actually the immigration department don't have a very high standard of proof in that respect. So what it translates into for the average visa applicant is that all the kind of good stuff that you've got going on in your opportunity is giving you the confidence to show that you can actually make the money that's forcing you in a sense to make this visa application and start this business in Hong Kong in the first place. Just show the immigration department what that is. Could be you've been having conversations with parties in Hong Kong that have said no we really want to we want to do some business with you we want to buy this particular mm -hmm. service off you or we want to we want you to develop this particular technology for us or we want to be able to access the expertise that you've got that we can't find locally through your own company as you so you have bring to come with to proof in the that you've got a realistic chance that your business okay. will not fail for want of valid commercial opportunity but the barrier okay. is not very high mm -hmm. e email correspondence is often enough oh, okay. so it's not difficult so a contract will be even better. Or even better, anything or, firm, or, anything yeah. that speaks to firm revenue. Device yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those are the, all told, those are the four things. A good story, clear pathway to the creation mm -hmm. of local employment opportunities, a properly set up office, two types of resources. Resources which speak to the ability for the business to generate revenues in line, in, in, aligned with the numbers that are detailed in the financial projections and also the uh, cash that you need to be able to commercialize your plan and meet your financial commitments as they fold you. Okay. So if you've got all of that at play in your opportunity, particularly if you come to Hong Kong with a, a prior entrepreneurial uh, success story in your background, that would be way easier. even better. Or if you better. move your company here, basically, if, if you're, like, you're from uh, Australia, you say, okay, I'm done with Australia, I want to move to, uh, to Hong Kong, and then it's easy to, I mean, easy. it would be way easier to get the visa. Redom or, redomicile, Or correct. unfortunately, with what's happening now, like uh, in the, in the mid, I mean, uh, in Israel, for example, if you want to, to take your, your, your family in Hong Kong and uh, continue your business here, that's also something 100%. that could be possible. 100%, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So those are the kind of like uh, business investment visa as an entrepreneur pathways, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then there's 
two other pathways that we can talk about. One is quite realistic, the other is less so. Okay. Um, I'll talk about the one that's less realistic, simply because it's the one that tends to get the most air time, but is the one that's most, most misunderstood. Well, partying in LKF, finding a local wife? And getting the dependent. No, visa. I would never, I would never <laughs> countenance anybody to get marriages for immigration purposes. But uh -huh. I, there's obviously a lot of convenience associated with that. Short-term convenience, although uh -huh. um, I've been married 35 years, so I'm used to the long-term notion. And I know that you've been married not quite as long as I have, but quite seriously, a very long time. So um, you, we don't need to pursue that one too closely. No, the one I'm talking about is called the Quality Migrant Admission Scheme. It's been on the books for 20 odd years. It's un, at the moment it's subject to some temporary enhancement measures, which means that the program has been slightly liberalized in certain areas to encourage foreign nationals who might qualify for positive consideration to make an application under this visa program. But here's a rub. The rub is that it takes at least 12 months to get this visa. Not it's a months. black box type application. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of administration backwards and forwards with the immigration department showing that the quality of your CV, the quality of your business and personal experience, the quality of your education is all made out in fact. So it's quite administratively heavy. Um, it used to be subject to a quota of 3,000 approvals each selection exercise and there's mm -hmm. three, four ex selection exercises a year typically. Um, they've temporarily removed the quota until 2024, early, early 2025 it is actually, about 18 months or so to go now I think, which means that you can go into the application and the number of points that you're granted, because it's a points based system, Mm -hmm. will get you into the hunt in your particular sector of commercial or um, professional activity. Mm -hmm. used to be that you would then compete with others that were in your sector group depending on the number of points that you got. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody had higher points than you, if it was one or two, if the quota was satisfied, there's no room for you, you failed. That's gone. So they've removed the quota piece. Mm -hmm. So basically it means that if you can pass the uh, must meet criteria which is part one and then get all the additional points that you can muster under part two you take the part one number and the part two number add them together go into a pool for selection if the immigration department like what you represent and think that they would want to have you in Hong Kong as a talent to contribute mm -hmm. then they'll give you a two-year visa no employer required, no need to engage in any business, and your family can come with you. And you basically get two years to come and settle in Hong Kong mm -hmm. to create a business or to get a job or to, to, to devolve and uh, contribute your talent to Hong yeah. Kong. This is a bit of a lesser known one, but I remember even 15 years ago, it already existed. Nobody knew about it. it was yeah. a, it's, a, it's a bit of an obscure visa. Agreed. But basically is what you have to be young and I mean, to have all the chances on your side, if I remember well the point, because I checked it out b back yeah. then, I mean, yeah. 15 years ago. Uh, so I, don't, I guess it has changed a little bit, but you had to be young, have as many diplomas as possible, and uh, yeah, and experience obviously. You get points, or yeah, you get points for your age, mm -hmm. you get points for your marital status, you get points for your language So is it better abilities. to be married or not? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, and it's better to be married to somebody who is, who's got an advanced education equal to yours as well because all of these mm -hmm. add up in terms of the total number of points that you can get. You can get extra points if you've gone to a world leading university and you get a certain number of points for the type of you know work that you've done and the length of time that you've done it and so on and so forth. But the, the truth is most smart cookies mm -hmm. are able to pass the must meet criteria and then get in the extra point pool to be in the hunt and as I say now because the quota has gone mm -hmm. you're not actually competing against anybody it's a case of well if they like your application and you're at their eyes drawn to your application because you've got a decent number of points and there's mm -hmm. a decent chance that look, you'll get the you'll get the visa so there's advantage there's an advantage to do go it go for it now but the disadvantage of it taking a year 
still there and you don't know whether you're going to get approved at the end of it so you can in a sense put your life on hold for 12 months set your family's expectations hopefully moving to Hong Kong and uh, go through this very very burdensome administrative exercise mm -hmm. getting the immigration department to the point where they can validate your eligibility for the points mm -hmm. uh, and then still get refused so it's not a great program but it's there and mm -hmm. it, if you ain't got anywhere else to go and you don't mind doing all the paperwork you don't mind you know having it on the back burner whilst you get on with the, the rest of the life for the, for the, the business investment visa as well. if you haven't got the money it's, yeah. It, yeah that's true so it's an option mm -hmm. right it's yeah. absolutely an option it, because yes. it's a scheme you can you can have that ongoing you can put other applications in at the same time mm -hmm. which is different than if you're applying for visas anyway so that's the outlier that's the yeah. one that we tend not to recommend and tend not to do although mm -hmm. we've got a few on the go at the moment um, the other one that's really quite interesting is what's known as the Top Talent Pass. This came into place the last week of December 2022. Mm -hmm. This is designed for, well there's three types of individual who can qualify for one of these Top Talent Pass visas. If you, get, if you do qualify, you get a two year visa to start and at the end of the two years you need to have started a sizable business of your own under that visa or you have got a job with a well-established business in Hong Kong mm -hmm. earning a compensation that's broadly commensurate with market rates paid to similar professionals in Hong Kong at the end of those two that two year that you get you get a three-year extension and they get a three-year extension and then, you PR. And then you, you'll qualify at seven years for PR and you can change employers and change business activity employment activity freely while you hold that visa so mm -hmm. if you can get the visa it's a great way into hong kong and at the moment it's only taking six to eight weeks compared to 12 months oh, wow. and the administration is a lot easier what does it entail so there's three categories a b and c category a is for those high earning individuals that have earned more than two and a half million hong kong dollars in salary or own business income in the 12 months immediately prior to submitting the application for this mm -hmm. status. So 280,000? Yeah, 280,000 yeah. well, US. Typically this, pro this, this profile would have a business investment visa like that basically. Well, uh, con well concept. I mean if, if it's from business proceeds, if it's from salary maybe not. but. Uh, well, indeed, uh, indeed. But the thing to the thing to it's understand faster. is that yeah, I mean, all you have to do yeah, much faster. And from an administration perspective, the only argument you need to win is to mm -hmm. show that you're in the money, and generally that's receipts um, and filings with the taxation agency wherever you've earned the money or wherever you're supposed to file your taxes to prove the existence of that income or those mm -hmm. own business uh, dividends. Um, so that's category A. Category B is you've graduated from a world top 100 university and I've had a minimum of two out of the last five years working experience. Um, the top 100 university are all the usual suspects. There's a list which the Immigration Department put out. It's got to be a bachelor degree, so advanced degrees don't count. There's some underlying policy reason for that that doesn't make any sense to me, but it's only bachelor degrees. But if you went to the London School of Economics, like I did, or you went to Oxford or Cambridge or mm -hmm. went to Harvard or Princeton or you, any of the major universities in Australia, the I can't think from France off the top of my head, to be honest. I can't think if there's anywhere, any school in Belgium that qualifies. In Belgium, we have, I think we have two. Hey, well, you've seen the, the top list. 100, but I, I didn't check the list. But, but uh, it depends which list they are using. You know, there is well, no, it's an immigration department specific uh -huh. list. But yeah. we can we, we can pin the list to, uh, to to the video, right? And then mm -hmm. you can check it out for yourself. But if you're on the list, and you've had two out of the last three years working experience, or is it three out of the last five? Anyway, it's last five, two or three years. I think it's I think it's two years, not five years, about three years. Anyway, category C, you need to have two two years of working or three years of working in the last five um, top bachelor degree from a top you 100 university and then you get this visa that gives you basically free and clear access to Hong Kong for mm -hmm. um, uh, for two years at least and then category C is basically the same as category B but without the need to prove the working experience and if you don't have the working experience, it just means that there's a quota that, of 10,000 approvals every year. 
It's designed basically for fresh graduates. Mm -hmm. So you still got to graduate from the top 100 university. You don't need to have any working experience. You might not get a visa under that category because there's only 10,000 issued a year. Having said that, um, if you can show that you've worked two or three out of the last five years, you can qualify under category B and not have to worry about um, mm -hmm. uh, any quota. Or if you've earned two and a half million Hong Kong dollars, uh, in the pri previous 12 months as I say then you will qualify under category A and whether you go A, B or C you get the same type of visa mm -hmm. free and clear come to Hong Kong work for anybody work for yourself start your own business just prove at the time that your visa comes up for expiry that you become settled in Hong Kong and you're and deploying the talent that the visa was set up to access in mm -hmm. the first place and you can bring your family as well obviously. the family as well and I saw is around in terms of number I think it's around a hundred thousand since the program started right they I saw said the standard there was, was hundred and sixty thousand hundred sixty already oh. hundred sixty thousand applicants I think, they, I think they've approved ninety thousand okay. it might be about ninety thousand yeah. So there's a lot in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually had a negative impact on the rest of the immigration department because only about five and a half thousand people work for the immigration department. Or well, when you've got 160,000 influx, in one influx of, of one new visa type that didn't exist 10 months ago, someone's got to administer that work, right? So mm -hmm. immigration officers have been taken off the kind of you know other visa types where they've been historically deployed to focus their efforts on this particular batch so now there's I was on the radio ITHK radio through the government radio session a couple of weeks ago and they were asking the question you know how how beneficial has this particular visa type proven to be uh, for Hong Kong so far because mm -hmm. um, it would appear that Whilst a lot of these visas have been applied for and a lot have been approved, there doesn't seem to have been a particularly marked impact on the job vacancy um, situation in Hong Kong at the minute. So, so what they do, they come here for well, they get tourism, they, they, no, no, they get they, they get the visa and they they, they apply overseas and they hold on to it. And then they sort of take the time oh, okay. and decide when they want to come in. Out. It's a bit of an insurance policy because it only costs you twenty-five US dollars, right, to get the to to get the visa issued. So they try, but they don't even come. Well, that was the premise of the radio show. If there's all these visas that are being issued, where is everybody yet? But it's still early days, and you get six months to activate it once you've been approved. So I have a lot of confidence that a lot of these people will beat uh, their way to Hong Kong because they're all the, they are the jobs here. They are the opportunities here. Um, Europe's going to hell in a handbasket, right? The US isn't much further behind. The uh, economic shock that's ahead for the West uh, is going to mean that uh, the global South, Northeast Asia, Hong Kong being the most international part of China, all the rest of that story, I think is going to uh, serve to be of real use and benefit to the brightest and best that uh, are seeking opportunities that are available this part of the world that might not be available in the West for you know the next few years until matters yeah. get sorted out there. And as you said, Hong Kong is eager. Even if you compare with other jurisdictions in Asia, like Singapore, Singapore is kind of a building wall. It's like, please stop coming. But Hong Kong is the opposite. It's like, please come in, right? Well, you have to, that's a great, good point. So, so as you know, Laurent, Hong Kong, Singapore have always kind of been in this historical sort of competition. Mm -hmm. But the only reason for the competition is because we're, our economies are kind of ostensibly the same size. We're both sort of city states, right? One's in Southeast Asia, one's in Northeast Asia. Um, the development of the economy from, well, when Singapore became a state and Hong Kong started to really come into its own um, around about the time that Singapore was founded. So the two economies have kind of grown in tandem mm -hmm. and there's been this tension and this competition between the two of us. And, and so I always say, well, especially now, well, where, where are we in that game? As you've just pointed out, well, the Singaporeans, they make it difficult for foreigners to come and do things there. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. It's a hard thing at the moment compared to how it's been historically. Hong Kong is easy at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the difference between Singapore and Hong Kong, when you get right down to it, is that Singapore is, let's say, a rapidly maturing state that's in an advanced state of nation building 
those are the core priorities. I mean, Lee Kuan Wun has done an abs did an absolutely amazing job to do what uh, he did for Singapore, and the political leadership, um, cr all criticism aside, that has prevailed since you know his time in office and subsequently his death has proven more of the same. You know, the, the you, you can only say that the 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 the, the Singaporeans only get better and better and better. They get better off, right? That's that's it. That country works for Singaporeans, and God bless them because they've done a bloody good job. Some say that China's heading in that direction. They they are trying to sort of long term emulate what the China political model might look like, following along the lines of the Singapore model. That's open for discussion and debate, be that as it may. But it's trying to not be political. So no, indeed, no, no. <laughs> No. I'm, I'm not expressing political ideas. No, no, I'm ne neither am I. No. What I'm seeking to do is to um, show what Singapore is all about versus what Hong Kong is all about in the backdrop or the context of kind of like what's going on, all things considered, based on my 35 years of living in the region, right? Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is not Singapore because Hong Kong is the most international part of China. Mm -hmm. We are um, blessed with British common law. We're well-established uh, banking and international finance centre, completely respected by all the major governmental and other uh, institutions, such uh, are responsible for affording Hong Kong as you know the international banking and financial centre that it is. We are now the recipient of all of the sort of crypto regulatory stuff that China doesn't want in its main borders it's putting them into Hong Kong so there's a regulatory arrangement coming now to the fore to be able to anticipate um, virtual assets NFTs crypto that whole thing is going to be regulated you know in accordance with the SFC rules and regulations that provide prevail in relation to other asset classes mm -hmm. so you know these things aren't going away they have to be regulated somewhere China very smartly saying we don't want them in our borders but Hong Kong can have all of that Thank you very much, because that means that Hong Kong becomes attractive from mm -hmm. that perspective. We, as of, as we've been talking today, we've always been a net importer of foreign national talent. So we're wide open to getting the brightest and the best around the world to come and contribute into you know, to our economy and, and our society. Um, but the most important thing is the long-term trend, right? We've seen what's happening with BRICS. We've just yeah. had another six members join the, the whole Transasia thing, Russia, China. So, you know, say what you want about the reason for why this has come to pass and not being political, but these are facts of life. Yeah, objectively, you can start to see the blocks uh, designing themselves. You know, so why are, obvious, yeah. why, are, why are we not going to, why would you not want to be in Hong Kong? Because this is where it's all happening. Mm -hmm. And it ain't happening anywhere else like that. You can certainly go to Beijing and China and take advantage, Beijing and Shanghai and take advantage of all the good things that those cities have got to offer. You can certainly be uh, in other parts of Asia and take advantage of the good stuff that's coming out of India right now, for example. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things happening, let's say, in parts of Indonesia with free trade zones and the like. Interesting stuff and stuff happening in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, Dubai. You know, these are all they've all got great stories ahead. Turkey, Istanbul is a great place to be. I've just spent and I know you have interest in Bulgaria, as I have, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just spent the summer kind of being based in Bulgaria and being right next door to Istanbul, and there's a lot of good stuff going on there. So they've all got great reasons to, you know, be based in those places. But when you pull all the threads together and you think about, you know, where's the growth, where's the long-term opportunity, especially for, you know, accessing the China market, the Greater Bay Area, into ever closer integration between Hong Kong and those economies. You know, we've, we've got 350 million people in the Greater Bay Area. That's the population of the United States. Mm -hmm. It's within three three miles drive from where we are. You know, so the only problem we don't we don't know yet what's going on with this Greater Bay Area. You know, well, we, we hear it since like what ten years now or something. Indeed. It's like, okay, so what is it exactly? What's happening? You well, know? it's a fact of life, <laughs> right? It's a fact of yeah. life. So if you want to be anywhere um, in this part of the world, come to Hong Kong. Cool. I think we will keep that uh, for the, the, the last word you know, of, of the interview. Uh, so thanks, uh, Stephen, for, for coming today, joining us. Uh, thanks for your 
uh, a wealth of knowledge there on, on visa. I think it was really useful for, well, for, for me actually, it's, uh, for a start, just to get an update on what's going on and then for the people watching this video. So uh, thanks a lot and let's see if we can see you in another video one day, let's see. For yeah. a new update, maybe next year or something. I'm all yours, um, Laurent. And in the meantime, if anybody wants to access my daily blog, Mm -hmm. which I update uh, with high quality content every single day. It's hongkongvisageezer.com. Here we are.